O'Neill Cruz doesn't look like shortstops do. And that alone is going to have people discussing, probably no matter what he does, forever and ever, whether or not he should be at the position. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins that I hope you'll take the time to check out. Probably the most significant side effect or domino to fall as the result of Kevin Newman being traded for a middle reliever from Cincinnati is that you now have Cruz at short and anybody else who fills the position is just going to be doing exactly that, filling the position the way you saw Diego Castillo would move over there, Rodolfo Castro. They'd be backups. They'd be guys that you'd rely on on Sunday afternoon or whenever it is that Derek Shelton decides to give Cruz a day. But he's the shortstop. It doesn't mean, as Ben Charrington made clear over the weekend, they won't continue looking for someone else or whatever else. But when you make that kind of a trade, moving a known commodity who, by the way, For whatever else you want to say about Newman and his exit velocity and how everything he hits is so soft, he still had some of the better offensive stats for the team in the second half of the season. So you don't just throw that out and then go bring back another one. Cruz is going to be the shortstop. Now, Charrington wouldn't go and definitively state that Cruz is going to be the shortstop for all time. So they, and, and, and nobody would or should do that. But to date, to date, I haven't seen any reason to even think about moving him out of there. Yeah, I mean, some of the errors don't look great. And 678 chances, he had a total of 17 errors. Seven of them were in the field, so 10 were throwing. And if you were paying attention, and if you're the kind of person who presses play on a podcast with this name in late November, I'm guessing that you were, you saw that most of these throws were just eminently preventable, meaning the the misfires. He just wouldn't set himself right, or he'd get a little bit lax, or he'd lean on that arm strength, thinking he had all day. And then at the last second, maybe pushing it a little bit too hard. I don't know. I I tried several times over the course of the season, once notably in Denver, to really pin down Shelton on this topic about this step slide or, or this thing that Cruz would do with his back foot that made it look like it might be throwing off his throws. And Shelton insisted that wasn't it. He's just plain old missing. So if you take the throws out of it, how much does he help with the range that he has, which also is not hurt by his size and the few number of steps it takes for him to get to a baseball? And then what's the lineup factor? This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800-degree stone, and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. See, this is where it starts to get impossible to measure anything, because the context for this should be what does the Pirates lineup look like when they're good? Meaning like really good, like contending. Because if you can put six or seven legit bats around him in the field, then you can basically house him and house his bat at a spot on the field where you normally wouldn't have an impact, certainly not a power bat. That's a heck of a thing. And every time I've attempted to argue with anybody, sometimes just to be devil's advocate, 
within the Pirates about whether or not he should stay at shortstop, that's the thing that comes back. It's the Troy Tulowitzki factor, meaning when Tulowitzki first came up with the Rockies. You say, oh, do you want him here? Do you want him there? Because he's a power hitter and because he was a, a bigger guy than most shortstops, something that Cal Ripken, for the most part, really kind of pioneered. And you'd come back to, okay, but what if the Rockies, and they ended up doing this, put a bunch of hitters around him and you leave him at shortstop? And Tulowitzki's probably not the best example I can summon because Tulowitzki was also pretty good defensively and nobody really questioned that. But it still felt awkward to have someone of his capabilities, his general capabilities and his size at the position. As ever, I always come back to the bat needs to play. One way or another, find a way to get your best eight bats out into the field. Oh, and you want another variable in this? I got one for you. He loves it. He considers himself in every way, shape, and form to be a shortstop. And when the Pirates tried to mess with that, and you might recall some of this, whether it was in Altoona or then on into Indianapolis, he barked back. He didn't like it. And you can say, well, it's just a rookie. He just needs to shut up and do whatever it is that they tell him to do. But when you're a rookie... Or even if you're not a rookie, even if you haven't even made it to the majors yet, if you know, and he's known this for a long time, that you can do stuff that other humans can't do, especially at the plate, you've got yourself a little bit of leverage. If he wants to be the Pirates, I don't know, I'm going to make this sound too dramatic, but franchise shortstop or whatever, he can hit his way into that as long as he stays competent from the defensive standpoint. I'd like to think that he can, if only because of that throwing errors number that I gave you. Now, if you factor out those innings and you put them into what would constitute a 162-game season, it's not going to look great. I mean, you're talking about now getting up into 40 errors out of the shortstop position that's asking a lot. But if all he does, if all he does is improve on the single most routine thing that he has to do out there, and that's to throw the ball in a straight line to first base, I'd like to think that can be achieved. You know, that's not the most ambitious goal. That's not something that should be anybody's stop sign in this process. When we come back, J1Q. from Neil. And I'm laughing because I'm glancing ahead here. He says, DK, quit teasing us. I'm ready to hear all the 2012-2013 stories of how the players goaded management into actively supporting the Major League team. Neil, that's more time than I've got uh, to share in a, in a single J1Q segment. So between that and not wanting to betray um, you know, too many trusts here, I'm going to keep this pretty, pretty basic. Okay. The leadership of that team, which was not as it was necessarily portrayed by some who weren't inside that room, meaning everybody seems to associate everything about those three playoff teams in general with AJ Burnett. Like AJ just came in and took over the entire process. AJ wasn't that guy. AJ did a lot of different things that gave those pirates some swagger that they hadn't had before some credibility that they'd lacked, like as in all of it. <laughs> and then he he was able to instill that attitude in other guys. He was not necessarily the leader of that pack. If I throw out the name Travis Snyder, most of you won't even probably have heard of who he is. Uh, he was a, a bench guy who ended up spending some time in, as a starter in left field, but he wasn't like somebody that you'd go, wow, that was the Travis Snyder team. But he was a big, loud voice in that room. And he wasn't alone. There was a bunch of guys. 
And I can tell you that of that bunch of guys, they made way more noise in the direction of 115 Federal, meaning specifically at Neil Huntington, the GM, but also over Neil Huntington toward Frank Coonley and even Bob Nutting about what they felt they needed and what they wanted to be successful. And since I'm not dropping names here and I'm not going to drop names here, it's kind of tough to relay the next part to you. But let's just say that there was a handful uh, out of that room there uh, of those players who had an awful lot of uh, gumption and weren't at all shy about making their own stances clear on certain things. And within that, within that group, they are currently observing the players on the 2022 roster, the guys who matter, the Brian Reynolds, the key Brian Hayes, and so forth. And they keep waiting for someone, anyone, to come along and look like the next wave of what they achieved, meaning someone who says, hey, what's going on here? What are we doing? Why? Are, how, how long are we going to keep you know, punting? How long are we going to keep dragging this out? Can we just go ahead and compete now? It hasn't happened yet, and they don't see anyone in there who can make that happen. I don't see or hear or feel anyone being in there who can make that happen. Where does that come from? It tends to come from the outside. It tends to come from someone like a David Freeze walking into your clubhouse and saying, what in the heck is this? That's not there right now. And that's why I keep bringing up again and again and again and again how important it is for somebody, anybody over there to start looking and sounding as if they're competitive. Because it's not just the owner. It's not just the front office. It's not just the manager and the coaches. It's also the players. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone who listens to Daily Shot of Pirates. No, you're not going to get more out of me on this one tomorrow. But I will be back.